Hello again, Steve Fentress for the Strassenburg Planetarium at the Rochester Museum and Science Center with Mars, we meet again. Perhaps you have been noticing in the eastern sky in the early evening a very bright orange star-like light, almost disturbingly bright. It's Mars, brighter than usual this fall because as we will see in a moment, this is one of those times when Earth and Mars are closer together in space than usual. And as you stand outside staring at this weird orange dot of light looking back at you, you can think about what we have found on Mars so far. Dried up lake beds, a world that almost certainly had water in the past, and we wonder whether there was ever life there. Let's see the place of Mars in our solar system and its relationship to us using the free NASA's EYES software. The Sun in the center of our solar system, the orbits of Mercury and Venus. Venus, now there's another story. Earth. And about half again as far out from the Sun as we are, the orbit of Mars. Notice, if you will, the orbit of Mars is closer to Earth's orbit over on one side of the solar system than over on the other side. That makes a difference in how Mars appears in our sky. For this beginning of our demonstration, I have set the NASA's Eyes software to a special date, August 27th, 2003. On that date, Earth and Mars, by a tiny sliver, were closer together than they had been at any time in the previous 60,000 years, so there was a lot of excitement about seeing Mars in the sky. At that same time, there were two spacecraft on their way from Earth to Mars, Mars Exploration Rover B, Opportunity, and MER A, Spirit. Let's put time into fast forward now. Each planet revolves around the Sun at its own speed. Earth goes faster than Mars, and it's closer. It has a shorter way to go to complete one lap. So Earth catches up to Mars and passes Mars about every 26 months. There goes Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2005 from Earth to Mars. Interplanetary spacecraft from Earth to Mars follow these smooth, curving orbits. The spacecraft is like a little planet in an elliptical orbit during its flight. And the launch is timed just right so that the spacecraft will meet Mars. There's Mars Phoenix, which landed near one of the polar regions of Mars. So these close approaches occur a little less often than every two years. Here's the 2009 approach. The Mars Curiosity rover was originally scheduled to go to Mars in 2009, but the spacecraft wasn't ready, so the engineers decided it would be wiser to wait for the next go-round. There it goes. That's the Curiosity rover. MAVEN is a spacecraft to study the atmosphere of Mars and find out what happened to it. Mars Orbiter mission was the first Mars mission sent from India. TRACE GAS ORBITER, a European mission, investigating this mystery of what happened to the atmosphere of Mars. We're going to slow time down as we approach the current time. MARCO A and B were little experimental spacecraft accompanying the Mars InSight lander, which landed in 2018.
and watch for July of 2020 when the latest NASA spacecraft, the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, is launched. Also during this close approach, as we'll see later, China and the United Arab Emirates sent spacecraft to Mars, and they are on their way there as well. Now we're going to creep through time here and stop on the exact date that Mars and Earth are closest for this, uh, this approach. That's October 6th, 2020. We're almost as close as we were in 2003, so Mars is really bright. And then I'm going to very delicately adjust the controls here. I'm aiming for October 14th, a few days later. That is the date that Mars, Earth, and the Sun are closest to being in a straight line. And that's a time technically called opposition because from the point of view of Earth at that time, Mars and the Sun are nearly in opposite directions in the sky. Main thing to remember, we're close in early October. Now let's advance time until Mars 2020 lands in February of 2021. and just enjoy this dance of the planets for a year or so off into the future. So Mars is a little farther from the sun than we are. That means it gets uh, less heat from the sun than we do. What other comparisons can we make? Mars is about half the size of Earth. Its axis is tilted almost the same, so it has seasons like Earth's seasons, though longer. A day on Mars is 24 hours and 40 minutes, so similar to Earth in that respect. Very thin atmosphere on Mars, however. It's mostly carbon dioxide, only about 1% of the atmospheric pressure we have on Earth. So under current conditions on Mars, as shown by this little movie of a dust devil taken by one of the Mars rovers, the existence of liquid water on the surface of Mars for any length of time is impossible. Even cold water boils away and evaporates in this very low atmospheric pressure. Yet there are many signs that Mars once had a lot of water on its surface. Billions of years ago, maybe Mars looked like this with a great ocean, especially in the northern hemisphere. So what happened? Mars must have had a thicker atmosphere at one time. The MAVEN spacecraft is making measurements like this of the Martian atmosphere to figure out what the sun is doing to it. The stream of particles called the solar wind impacts Mars. Mars being a smaller planet than Earth and colder inside does not have a magnetic field to protect itself from this solar wind. And so it looks like that solar wind stripped away the Martian atmosphere billions of years ago, causing giant climate change and leaving us with the cold desert that we find today. However, measurements from recent spacecraft, including the Curiosity rover, show that there were once lakes in places like this on Mars, and the chemical environment could have supported microscopic life of the kind we have on Earth. How do we find out about ancient microscopic life on Earth? Paleontologists look at rock formations like this, petrified mats of bacteria from billions of years ago called stromatolites. They make very thin slices of these rocks and examine them with a microscope, changing the focus like this to focus in on different little dark particles. And then to analyze their chemical composition, use giant instruments like this, much too big to put on a spacecraft. So that brings us to the Perseverance rover. You know, Mars is the closest place that we can reach with robotic exploration that we think had a really good chance of having ancient life. The Perseverance rover will land at a location called Jezero Crater. Jezero Crater is a very interesting place. It's a crater that once held a lake. There are a lot of craters on the surface of Mars that could have once hosted ancient lakes, but not every crater that we think had a lake actually preserves evidence that that lake was there. It had an inflow channel and it had an outflow channel. 
That means it was filled, the crater was filled with water. In Jezero, we have probably one of the most beautifully preserved delta deposits on Mars in that crater. This is a wonderful place to live for microorganisms, and it is also a wonderful place for those microorganisms to be preserved so that we can find them now so many billions of years later. There is no other place on Mars that has the unique combination of a lake setting, a beautifully preserved delta, and the diverse mineralogy that we have in Jezero Crater. So it's truly a special landing site. The major goal of the Perseverance mission is to investigate astrobiology on Mars, and in particular, to address the question of whether life ever existed on Mars. The Perseverance rover starts with a design that's very similar to Curiosity, but we've added to it a whole new set of science instruments. And these science instruments were purposefully selected to help us in the search for biosignatures. We're gonna be taking uh, microphones with us. For the first time, we're gonna have uh, that human sense on another planet. Perseverance carries with her a grand experiment in space-faring technology, a helicopter the name of which is now Ingenuity. One of the major upgrades that Perseverance has from Curiosity is that it's able to self-drive for a distance of up to 200 meters per day. As the rover is driving, it's literally building the map of the road it's driving on on Mars. Scientists for years have told us that to really unlock the secrets of Mars, we have to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So what Mars 2020 is going to do is to drill samples, put them in small tubes. We're gonna seal it in its own individual tube. We set them on the surface to provide a target for the second two missions, which hopefully will get in development in the next several years and could potentially get the samples back to Earth by 2031. Perseverance is a very, very profound first step in both our understanding of our place in the universe and a stepping stone towards human exploration on Mars. Let's watch Perseverance take off. The Perseverance uh, the rover going. headed to Mars, ready to ride a column of fire and smoke on its way to the red planet. And lift off. As the countdown to Mars continues, the perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the red planet. And Atlas TU has gone to close loop control. Standing by for SRV burnout shortly. And we have successful separation of Mars 2020 with the Perseverance rover. Flight now. We now have an acquisition of signals. And the years of blood, sweat, and tears from every person who worked on this mission is now realized as Perseverance makes its way to Mars. While we're watching Perseverance, we can remember that, like many other interplanetary spacecraft, its many cameras include lenses made right in the Rochester area by the Optimax Systems Company. And any optical component that goes on a spacecraft has to be perfect, because once this thing has left the Earth, there is no way to go to it and repair it. The Mars 2020 rover is traveling inside an aero shell, which will approach Mars at high speed next February. And to hear about what happens next, let's listen to one of the engineers in charge of the landing. One way or another, you're going to be on the ground in seven minutes. We want it to be there safely. I'm Al Chen, and I lead the landing team for Mars 2020. Entry descent landing is all about getting the vehicle from the top of the atmosphere down to the bottom safely. And we hit the atmosphere going, you know, 12, 13,000 miles per hour. Uh, we have to deploy a supersonic parachute. I mean, that's all before we get down into power flight. See, we have a new system that'll take over at this point. 
It'll start taking images of the ground. That'll let us figure out where we are in latitude and longitude. Uh, Jezero Crater, the site we're going to with Mars 2020, was actually rejected for curiosity because the site was considered too unsafe. And really, the train was way too rough. But now we have the ability to land at these places that we never really could go to before. The Jezero Crater site, if you look at it from space, is pretty obviously a delta. We think that Mars was habitable about four billion years ago. So the question is not just where was that life, but also where could it be preserved for four more billion years for us to find it later. I worked on Curiosity for 10 years, so this is a very familiar feeling. I think I was too young the first time to really realize what was at stake. I think G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 or we are in powered flight. I've been on the other side of this too. My wife was front and center on InSight. This is actually the same seat that my wife was sitting in for the InSight landing. The same seat that I was in actually uh, back in 2012 uh, for the Curiosity landing as well. Coming up on entry. A lot of history for us in this room. I'm sound confirmed. Proceed. We might be uniquely positioned as two folks who were married to each other to know what it's like to land things on Mars. So this is what's new compared to Curiosity. The rover carries in it a map of where it's going to land, and it can compare that to what it's seeing and guide itself. Here's a test of the camera over Death Valley. Back to an engineering visualization. The parachute has been deployed. We're descending toward the landing site. At a suitable height, the back shell comes off the aero shell and falls away. And the descent stage begins photographing the ground and analyzing where it is compared to the map that it carries in its memory. Red zones don't want to land there. Big rocks that could flip the rover over. After the descent stage separates from its parachute, its rockets take over and it can steer itself to a nice, safe, but interesting place to land. Just above the surface, the rover is lowered on a bridle from the descent stage, so it's hanging from a cable. There's the parachute and the back shell falling away in the distance. And as soon as the rover hits the ground, the bridle is cut, and the descent stage continues to fire its rockets and fly away. Looks like a Tiger Woods drive to a safe distance. Now, one of the scientists who will be in charge of navigating the rover. When you go to another planet, there's just so much potential for making brand new discoveries. My name is Katie Stack Morgan, and I study rocks on other planets. The Mars 2020 will be seeking signs of ancient life in the rock record of Mars. The instruments are really well suited to look for things that we call biosignatures, which are signs that ancient life might have been there in the past. To really confirm that life had a hand in, in creating those signatures or textures, we really do need to bring those samples back. We have capabilities and laboratories here on Earth that we can't fit in a compact instrument on a rover. This is the Mars Yard and this is where our rovers practice driving over rocky terrain. We work together with the engineers to understand what type of terrain the rover can handle so that we can get to the most exciting places which are often the most challenging. So our landing site for Mars 2020 is Jezero Crater. What's really exciting about Jezero is that it has a beautifully preserved delta. They tend to be a really good place to preserve evidence of past life. And we look for things like organic matter that get concentrated in the rocks of a delta. So this rock is a sandstone, not unlike a rock that we might actually find in Jezero Crater. We would be interested in sampling a rock like this to understand what each individual sand grain has to tell us about Mars and its evolution. Growing up as a kid, we used to go on lots of hikes and would visit national parks for summer vacations. So when I found out that I had the opportunity to combine geology and love of the outdoors with exploring rocks on another planet, I thought, you know, this is really the perfect type of thing for me to do. Not only could I work on an interesting science project, but I could do it with a big team of people all working together with a focus goal. 
and I thought that's what I want to do. Meanwhile, other spacecraft are also going to Mars this year. This is the Chinese Tianwen-1 system. Tianwen means roughly heavenly questions. And this Chinese craft includes an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. Also going to Mars this year, the United Arab Emirates with a spacecraft called Hope. Returning to our sky, Mars rises about sunset and it's up all night. Take a moment to go outside and look, think, and wonder. <laughs> 